Hey everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Cat Report from the Cat Project. Uh, today is July 23rd, 2018, and uh, yeah, so for uh, anybody who's not like close friends, um, we, we appear to have acquired uh, uh, another hobby cat. Um, yeah, we're not going to discuss the number. <laughs> More than two, less than five. And uh, yeah, so this little guy here uh, is a recent acquisition, uh, not a Hobby Link Japan purchase. And, uh, yeah, so he's decided that, uh, when we got the camera set up, that, uh, that now was the premium optimum time to come over and hang out and demand some cuddles. Uh, so, uh, this episode, aside from new cats, we have, uh, the spot run announcements from Aoshima for September. We also have the October, uh, kit announcements from Fujimi, and, uh, We've talked about in the past couple of videos, this brings us up into that fun time of the year where, uh, you know, October is the last month they can sort of announce in the future before we start getting into the uh, Tokyo model and hobby show stuff that uh, that show was run in October with the other big show in Japan. And, uh, you know, that'll be our sort of late fall, early winter stuff that we uh, expect and that'll be, you know, new kits and things like that. Because at this point, uh, the only new tools that we're waiting on from the Shizuka show at this point are the R34 uh, sedan version from Aoshima, as well as the Mitsubishi uh, Colt Gallant uh, kit from Hasegawa. We've, of course, seen, uh, you know, Hasegawa announce a number of modified reissues to their new tools uh, with the BMWs and the Civics and things like that. Uh, but October is sort of the, you know, the last month that they can announce in advance because November, December, uh, and probably a little bit of October as well, uh, for, for perhaps, uh, Aoshima as well as, and, or, uh, Hasegawa will be, uh, you know, may include a new kit or two, or at least, uh, modified versions of, you know, things that will come out. I would expect that we will see, uh, a good deal of play with the R31 Skyline, uh, in, the fall and winter, with nay spring of 2019, as they do the other uh, three of the JTCC cars that were, uh, you know, run in the 1989 season when the Calsonic car came out. And then we have uh, this week's kit releases. I have a little couple of teasers on things. We have uh, Studio 27's uh, decals. Their livery decals for the month of July uh, were announced as well. So, uh, a little bit to cover here. So, let's go into it here. Now, this is a huge amount of stuff that uh, Aoshima has announced for Spot Run for September. Uh, this is typical for them if you go back through three years of this uh, nonsense that we've been doing. Uh, they really uh, pound out a restock for the fall and into the you know Christmas season. Christmas is not what we would you know, what we associate with in Japan necessarily, but it's still, you know, a holiday and uh, they want to get their kits out there uh, for that. And of course, various vendors, even in Japan, do that who do a lot of retail sales to the United States, North America in general, and to certain parts of Europe that would uh, celebrate it, if, as you would consider it, uh, have the uh, Black Friday things, uh, holiday sales after Thanksgiving. So, just going to plow a bunch of stuff into into uh, back into retailers so that they have their stuff. So, uh, 2014 Nissan GTR Pure Edition, 1973 Nissan Skyline GTR, 1974 Skyline, 2000 GTX, that's a four-door. Uh, 81 Toyota Soar MZ11, first-gen Soar. The Austin FX4 London Cab. The 2002 Mazda RX-7 Spirit R-Type B, that's the kit was just uh, reissued in that format of being the Type B Spirit R, uh, what, two months ago, maybe? So that quickly sold out. Um, I actually need to go back a couple more pages than that, because that's, <laughs> at this point, not stuff that isn't even released yet, as far as the Notebook of Knowledge is concerned. Da, 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 da. Yep, May. So, so so September, we're already seeing a reissue of that. Uh, reissue of the 78 Mitsubishi Gallant. Reissue of the 1998 Toyota Chaser Tour 5 uh, Cunny Z, that's the D1 Grand Prix uh, version of that kit. Reissue of the 2001 Urace Nissan Skyline R34, that is the four-door 
drift version of the uh, D1 Grand Prix car in that. The 85 Toyota Hilux Custom, that's sort of the lowrider kit. The 98 Toyota Chaser uh, Tour 5 in the Toyota Racing Development uh, body kit and wheels. Also the 20-inch BBS LMs and 20-inch Work Schwert SC4 wheels. The 19-inch Volk T37 Titanium and CE28M Volk wheels. And then in 14-inch wheels, you have the Kako Tekken and Formula Mest being reissued. Uh, reissue of the Lamborghini Sesto Elemento. Reissue of the Lamborghini Aventador 50th Anniversario. And then we have reissues of the Skyline 2000 GTX and Mark II Grande in the Grand Champion series. So, interestingly enough, we're seeing some reissues of the Grand Champ cars come back out with the more Grand Champion uh, series just about to start. Uh, I was kind of interested to see these reissues only in the sense that I did not expect them to like really reissue them. I figured that they would reissue the entire series of kits, which they did, all 16 of them, and then that would sort of be you know it. If you got one, you got one. If you didn't, you didn't. So it's kind of interesting to see them reissue these, uh, run some more, and then uh, when why not, really? Uh, at this point, there's still one of these that will, will be missing, and it's probably the one that most people would want. Uh, you have the reissue of the uh, Pontiac Firebird from Knight Rider kit from Season 3, as well as the SPM version, which is the uh, Super Pursuit mode, which has like the extended nose and the little uh, front splitter, or not front splitter, front canards, and the, the rare, raised rear spoiler, and things like that. Um, what can you say? It was a 1980s TV show, Airwolf, Knight Rider, and all that stuff was ridiculous anyway, so why not have a Super Pursuit mode of, of uh, kit? Uh, the one that I think a lot of people will want, though, is the car, the evil version of kit. Uh, that that kit of kit car <laughs> has not been out for quite a long time. Season 3 and the SPM haven't been out for a while either. They've reissued Season 1 and Season 4 a couple of times in the last five years, but not these two. So uh, for people who collect the Knight Rider stuff, uh, you know, be happy to have that stuff back out. Over in the October kit announcements from Fujimi. Now there's absolutely nothing here that is new or really particularly interesting, <laughs> but... A couple of the things are kind of unique, but and we cover everything anyway, so we have to we just have to plow through this. But uh, you'll see what I mean here in a second. So they're going to reissue the Toyota Velfire ZAG Edition van. That is the first of the uh, Snap Tight Next Gen uh, Toyota van kits. You remember they're going to be doing the Alfred next month, which is the you know stodgy upmarket trim. The Velfire is the uh, sport youth oriented, if you want to call a full size van youth oriented version that came out, um, I want to say about 18 months ago now. So, you're going to reissue that in black. That's going to be a straight reissue of the original kit. And then they're also going to be doing it in white pearl, which for people who don't want to try to paint a black van a different color might be a better option. Now, these are not pre painted, they're just going to be molded in a metallic white, which you know, you would wish that it would be for people who do the, the nude models, of, as it were, where they just polish out the plastic on in-color molded things. Usually you can't get away with that in metallics because the swirl uh, that comes with plastic flow, but we'll see. So that's a, a new kit for them is the white pearl version. And then they're also going to reissue both of the original colored Suzuki Hustler kits, the Passion Orange and the Summer, uh, yeah, Summer Blue Metallic versions. Now you'd be like, why are they reissuing that? They just did a white one this month, and you know, how many Suzuki, you know, hustlers can you really sell? Uh, apparently, more, I guess. The interesting thing with these two is that they're going to come with a set of side cutters in the kit. Uh, this is the first time I think I've ever seen this. Now there's been various companies, uh, Revelle's Germany and Heller are probably two of the biggest offenders of this. Uh, you know, and there was a point in time, I guess, when uh, what Revelle tried this with their youth-oriented builds, as well as I believe uh, AMT Ertl may have. I seem to recall this, but I, I may be thinking at Revelle twice, but. They've done the paint and glue in the box thing before, where you get some cheap enamel paint, a really, really cheap, uh, you know, 89 cent nylon bristle paintbrush, and, and a bottle of glue. And uh, I specifically remember the 86 Ford Thunderbird came out that way. Uh, there are several other kits that were done by Ravel at the same time. Heller does that with several of their kits where you can get paint and glue with them. Uh, we're going to talk about a Ravel of Germany kit uh, that comes with that stuff in it here in a second. But I've never seen a model company include side cutters 
which, you know, for the uninitiated, also known as nippers, are these things, right? You know, uh, these are the Tamiya 123s, uh, which is the part number on them. There's two different Tamiya side cutters. One stinks and the other ones are these. And, uh, you know, I, I've never seen, you know, a cheap set of Zuron side cutters. Well, it costs like seven, eight bucks, so it's not... I don't. I didn't look at the price to see if they're even raising the price for the side cutters being included, but that is definitely uh, an interesting approach to take. One of the things you, you've seen, I did a video. You've seen, I did a video. You saw, I did a video. God, that see, 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 soft scene thing really bothers me. So I hate when I do it to myself. But you saw, if you follow this channel, if you watch everything that we put on here, that I did a video what I consider the basics of modeling. And one of the things I included in the basics of modeling is a pair of side cutters because these are just, you know, I, I gotta I have to admit that I didn't have a pair of side cutters until I came back into the hobby as an adult. And when you have a pair, you're like, holy mother of all that is holy, how did I survive without these? Because this is frankly trying to cut things off with a hobby knife is a great way to bust the point off your hob off your blade and who knows where the point's going to go, or, you know, anytime you interact with your hobby knife, there's a chance it's going to roll off the table and land someplace you don't need it to be landing, uh, as well as, you know, everything else that goes along with that. I still have things on here. I was going to put it away. Um, and, you know, the, the, the cheap paint and glue that comes with some of the starter kits really aren't worth anything. You know, they're, they're really, really bad. Uh, I understand the principle behind it. Oh, look, it's a kit with glue and paint in it. It's everything you need no way to cut the stuff off the part runners cleanly. So the side cutter thing is an interesting idea. I'm interested to see how well those will sell. I mean, they're not going to sell well probably to anybody that you and I personally know, but uh, the camera, just a little bit crooked, at least from my eye. Uh, but in Japan, where Fujimi obviously is aiming their market for the most part, and Southeast Asia, having side cutters in the box, very, very interesting ploy, if you will, to sell some more of those kits. Um, also be very interesting to see whether or not those are run kits, like it's in like their brand new kits that they've had to run more of, or these are a bunch of NOS kits from the original release that they couldn't sell, and so they're throwing side cutters into them to try to move them. I didn't look to see if the parts numbers had changed. <coughs> Although I kind of wonder why, if you're going to buy a Hustler, and you wanted it in the orange or the blue colors and not the white one that I uh, bought that, you know, would be easier to paint. Why you wouldn't buy one of the new ones with the side cutters in it? Because, I mean, really, you could always use a pair of side cutters. Always use a pair of side cutters. Anyway, so there's two more things on here. The uh, Mini Cooper S. Now, of course, that's a BMW era Mini Cooper. Uh, it says on the box art it's the right-hand drive version, but the... The description of the kit says it's available for domestic and international handle choice and there's always a weird translational issue with mechanically translating japanese into english where handle means steering wheel uh <laughs> it legitimately does so that means to me that it has both left and right hand drive dashboards in it the right hand drive dashboard of course would be a domestic one for both the uk itself as well as japan uh international i would assume be left hand drive if this is left-hand drive, and I'll have to wait till it comes out, I'm not going to pre-order something on the off chance that it might be. If this ends up being left-hand drive, I may grab one of these just to get the dashboard out of it, sell it as a right-hand drive kit, because, I mean, sure, somebody wants one somewhere, and take that left-hand drive put uh, dashboard and parts and put it into the John Cooper Works version that I have, which I thought when I bought it had left-hand drive, but it does not. And then the last one here is going to be a reissue of their uh, McLaren F1 GTR long tail. Uh, this is now a DX kit, which for the uninitiated for Fujimi means deluxe. It means it has photo etch put into it. Uh, I've looked at the photo etch for it. It's basically what you would expect out of a very small sheet of photo etch fret, wiper, grills, the uh, rear vent piece on a, a McLaren, you know, is, is mesh uh, where the, you know, the engine cooling uh, is. Uh, brake faces and those type of things. It's probably you know about the size of a, a, a pack of cards. It's not very big, but that makes it deluxe and lets them charge about five dollars more for it. And it's going to be the uh, 1998 24 Hours of Le Mans number 40 EMI car. Now, uh, that's this one down here on the bottom, which is not going to be big enough for anybody to see. But Aoshima also did that same car 
for the uh, 1998 24 Hours of Le Mans. And frankly, if you want one, go grab one of those because it's a great deal better. Anyway, uh, although it does not come with photo etch, <laughs> I don't know if that makes it worthwhile or not to you because those McLaren, those Fuji McLarens are not the greatest thing on the face of the planet, frankly. Um, so that takes us to a few teaser items here, I guess. Now, we just talked about in one of the last videos, the whole uh, drama, if you will, that surrounds the uh, people who expect Fujimi, or not Fujimi, but Mobius, rather, and Ravel to constantly tell them what's going on. Like, they need daily updates. There should be a Ravel Mobius Twitter page, and they should constantly, every day, tell them, you know, oh, hey, today we scratched our butts, and we also drew the instructions to this kit. We, uh, in the comment section of that video, had a discussion between me and Scott of uh, Elm City Hobbies about, you know, how ridiculous that is, as well as the fact that a lot of people seem to forget that cars are almost a hobby to Mobius, right? Mobius did a lot of sci-fi stuff, a lot of uh, monster uh, figure kits and things like that, and cars are something relatively new to them, so they, it's not like they have a constant stream of them, and so... It can be months going by before you hear anything necessarily out of them in regards to a specific car or truck kit that you're looking at. It ends up being like, hey, look, Mobius comes to NNL East. They usually have some new stuff to talk about, and uh, maybe we get some kits during the year out of the automotive side of things. Otherwise, there's a bunch of sci-fi stuff and figure kits that are going to be come out in the meantime. Um, so what we found out was that apparently all of the uh, sales things have now come to a conclusion and everything has mellowed out over at Pegasus and we are going to proceed with Mobius once again. So allegedly for the beginning of August, now we'll see when these actually ship out, but I would expect them to be August, September because you know the last thing I want to do is tell a bunch of people they're going to release a kit and then not do it because oh my god the panic that will ensue there. We're going to get the uh, F-Series 4x4 finally. Uh, I don't have the box art for that because it's been ar out around for probably six, eight months now. I do want to remind you, however, if you don't remember, the box art for the F-Series 4x4 shows an F-250. Now, the contents of the box are an F-150. Uh, it is a much more sedate 4x4. I mean, it's a 4x4 like a modern 4x4 pickup truck, like a 1500 Silverado or a or an F-150, uh, you know, where it's not jacked up off the ground. Now, an F-250 was a heavy-duty, like, farm truck kind of thing. So it is a great deal more off the ground. It has, you know, heavy-duty wheels and tires and all those sort of things that are not in this kit. I think it's going to be, it's doing themselves an incredible disservice. I'm sure that they probably paid the guy who drew the box art prior to the sale going through to Pegasus, and Pegasus isn't going to pay to redraw the box art, but I think one of the it's doing a huge disservice to themselves and is going to cause a litany of complaints to roll forward for people who are not educated, such as the great viewers that you are, who are not going to realize that this is not a commercial F-250 pickup in this box, and they're going to, the, the, the parts are not going to match the drawings, and it's going to be a huge issue. Uh, so, buyer beware on that. Now, one thing that we had known was coming but hadn't really had any information on is this this is going to be a re a release from uh, Mobius with Model King so it's one of Dave Burkett's projects and that is Artie Beswick's uh, Comet a AFX 1965 Mercury Cyclone uh, very exciting for the vintage drag racing guys I've already seen the the uh, headers on the engine get or not headers but the valve covers rather on the engine get tore apart online as to whether or not they're correct or not uh, <laughs> whatever <laughs> I don't care about vintage drag cars in the first place so it really doesn't affect me one way or the other if they are or they're not but there seems to be a great deal of people who see a reproduction of the original car like how the car is now this car still exists from what I understand but now it runs a set of uh, injector tubes, if you will, uh, rather than the, the uh, dual carburetors that it ran originally. Now it has the more traditional camera forward engraved valve covers. At the time, it did not. It has the kind that are in the car, in this kit. So understand you're buying sort of an original type of deal here. Is it 100% correct for this car? No, of course not, because it's a model kit based on a street car. And so there are always going to be. 
uh, concessions to that. One of these would be the fact that the interior has what they're calling race pockets. It has a hoop uh, roll cage. If you look, if you stop your video here and turn your phone upside down or stand on your head if you're watching a computer, you can see that part up there. They got tack, uh, some additional racing gauges and things like that. Now, from looking at pictures of the original car, the car did not run a full hoop roll cage like that. It ran sort of a, a triangle where it was up over the driver and then went down on a diagonal into the floor. It wasn't a full roof full uh, hoop like that. Also, there was a passenger seat in the car. The car also was not painted. It was not a red interior car. Uh, you know, so you're going to have to do your research here on the 1-1 or determine whether or not that stuff, kind of stuff bothers you. But there is, of course, uh, new interior parts. There's an entirely new 427 uh, camera engine, and here you have the new hood. You have, uh, obviously, new decals, new wheels, new tires, all the drag uh, stuff to give it like sort of a, a not gas or front end gas are but rather a uh, straight axle front end to it and things like that so a lot of uh you know new parts in here to make it as close to being you know correct as possible but as all with all things uh you know there's always going to be that give and take with uh how correct you can make something that shares tooling with something else now i know that sort of sounds probably sounds like a little bit of backwards talk considering the the uh beating that we gave, uh, somebody described it, that we gave the uh, Savino Oldsmobile kit, but the Savino Oldsmobile kit was a brand new tool specifically designed to be a NASCAR kit. This is a drag car based off of a retail showroom stock, you know, replica stock car. It's, it, it's not the same. One is purposely designed, the other one is how can we make this into this other thing and, you know, keep the tooling as simplified and, and cost efficient as possible. So there's that. Also, and as both like I said, both of those kits are aiming for an August release, so we'll keep you up to date on those. Also announced uh, for July are the Studio 27 livery decals for this month. Uh, nothing GT3 related here, but there are several options for the uh, discerning rally connoisseur. So you have some 2002 uh, decals here. Obviously these are for the rally version of the Hasegawa kit. You have the uh, 1933 Alpenfart, the uh, Austrian <laughs> Alpine Rally, the 1935 Monte Carlo Rally, as well as the 1971 Tour de France Rally. None of these are particularly uh, complicated. None of them are so, hence, they're, none of them are really that expensive. The most expensive one being the Monte Carlo one with the front and the back uh, wraps for the hood and the trunk, coming in at around 17 bucks. The other one is, what, 15, the other one's 13. So, uh, you know, if you're into that sort of thing, uh, there you go. I would say there's probably a little bit of 1-1 issues here in terms of, like, wheels and things like that, because you obviously have some situations where uh, the wheels that the real car ran are not going to be the exact same wheels that the Hasegawa kit comes with. So be interested to see if Renaissance or Rege or anybody does any kind of wheel uh, conversions for these. I think the one that comes closest to having the wheels that are in the kit is the Monte Carlo one. It come, It uses the base TI wheels without the center uh, cap on them. However, this 75 is the, I, I believe, I would I have to see a rear end shot of it, I believe it is a 1975 BMW 2002, which is the one that has the square tail. It's not the round one, so you would need to take the rally kit and kit bash it into the turbo kit in order to get the correct body and uh, tail lights and headlights and things like that. So there's a little bit of expense there. I kind of like that livery the most out of these three options. I mean, one sort of a schnitzer uh, stripe there with the red, the, the progressive uh, two colors of blue and red. Uh, I like the Radio Monte Carlo thing, just as a sort of iconic, you know, sponsor of Monte Carlo Rally. And, uh, you know, I, I want to get any of these because I really don't want to build a 2002 rally car. We've already talked about how mine is destined to be a uh, 1971 BMW Ti, and that's going to be what it is. But for those people who are interested, those options will be uh, released probably uh, in the next week or two. That'll take us out to kit releases for this week. Uh, we have two domestic and everything else will be overseas. So domestically from round two, you have the the reissue of the uh, 69 Dodge Charger Snap Tight kit. Now this is the one that they did as, of course, the new uh, newly told Dukes of Hazard kit. This came out, what, two years ago maybe? 
Uh, from what I understand, it's a very nice kit. I mean, snap tight and all that sort of thing. I hear cat noises. And, uh, you know, it, it's pretty good kit for being a snap tight kit. Obviously, there is the kerfuffle, if you will, with the Dukes of Hazard and the uh, Confederate Union Jack. And, you know, that's not a battle flag. Ugh, don't even get me started. Uh, but, you know, we can't do that anymore. There's no, you know, Warner Brothers will license the property, so you can't reissue the kit even, no matter how round two feels about it. So it's not round two's fault. Don't start crapping on them. Uh, this, so this is the City Slicker. It's got some, I looks period correct, I'm, I'm guessing. I'm not really up on my California license plates, but I know those are older license plates. Uh, where you've got the, uh, a set of, uh, mag wheels thrown in here, and now it's just sort of a 69 Dodge Charger. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it is what it is. It's molded in blue, black, and I think silver or gray. Like, it's hard to tell what the interior color is without actually having the box in front of me because, uh, you know, a lot of these pictures you get online for people putting them up on eBay, their flashes are, whiting, are, are overpowering their white balance, and it's hard to tell if it's a white interior or a silver interior or a really, like, gray interior, but those are going to be your three colors. They're going to have a, a chassis color, if you will, the body color, and the interior it's designed for, uh, you know, the younger people, uh, primarily, so you're molding it in color to keep from painting and things like that. Also, out of uh, round two this month, or this week, is the uh, Wilson's Livestock Van. So, reissue of the Wil of the Livestock Van. Now we do, you know, have the Wilson's tie-in back with it. I know a couple of reissues of it have not had the Wilson's just been on a Livestock Van. Uh... New updated decal sheet for it here. Uh, they're saying the wheels are chrome. I don't know if that's a big deal. I've never had one of the Wilson Livestock trailers. Again, I know irony, tractor trailer driver who doesn't like to build tractor trailers. Uh, but, you know, I just, I've never had one of these, so I don't really know if the wheels were not chrome in previous versions. Um, I'm going to say that in 95% of applications, they would be chrome because guys who do livestock hauling, uh, you know, chicken lights and all that stuff. They tend to make their trucks uh, look good. And so, you know, there might be some sort of commercial livestock haulers out there, uh, places that are, you know, basically uh, hauling their own product, if you will. Uh, they might be using sort of a steel wheel just to save on money, but an independent owner-operator type of deal is going to have chrome wheels. So that's back out. Uh Vintage packaging. I know I'm reading the little sticker, but vintage packaging, I, you know, there's th this vintage packaging thing is is just to be expected. I think I could probably leave that part off the retro deluxe. But in fact, I think we take the whole retro deluxe thing and throw it out the window. We get the idea now. It's been six years. Uh, well, actually, no, it's been eight years now since the retro deluxe uh, shtick has started. And you're retro deluxing things again that have, you know, this can be. This is old enough to be retro deluxe, but. One of the things that uh, will be coming out before the end of the year is a reissue of the 1994 Ford F-150 Lightning kit. Remember that? That's an old AMT Ertl, uh annual kit, if you will. Uh, the actual annual kit wasn't the Lightning, but there was a short box, uh, short bed annual kit that went along with the long box. And uh, it's going to be released in vintage packaging. <laughs> No, vintage packaging for a 1990s AMT Ertl kit would be the 1990s AMT Ertl boxing. Wouldn't be something else. I'm trying to find, see if I have one laying around at arm's reach, and I really don't because I'm sort of stuck <laughs> looking at these. I mean, my my some of my Ford stuff is right here. I'm trying to see if I have, ah this be right here. This right here. I'm gonna check make sure I'm actually on camera. This would be a vintage retro deluxe box art, right? Because this is what the box art looked like when that kit came out originally. The box art that they're working on doesn't look anything like that. It's pretty nice. Don't get me wrong. It looks nice. And I would be interested in one only because, you know, I built one in 1994 and I don't have another one. Um, you know, is it retro deluxe? <sighs> kind of pushing that the, when you start... Boxing. I mean, you saw what happened with the uh, the Edsel and the Chrysler 300, uh, you know, 90s kits that they reissued here, where they're in a pair of matching boxes, but they're also, you know, it's not really retro deluxe because those kits came out with boxes that had the original that had real cars in the box art. So I don't know. 
Maybe it's just me. And really doesn't bother me. It just I just find it really amusing in reality. Uh, so let's go overseas real quick. Let's wrap this one up. Uh, we got the release. This was supposed to be come out last month, but it came out this month uh, of the Platts Fujimi uh, Pacific Racing Nissan Silvia S14 D1 Grand Prix 2017 car. Yay for dancing anime girls barely wearing any clothing. Uh, your divorce may vary. This is, of course, the Fujimi S14 in the box with uh, decals provided by Platts. There is a rear spoiler. Now, the kit itself would not come with one because it, it, the kit itself doesn't exist as a drift car. But the kit does come with a rear spoiler. I believe it's a resin piece because it doesn't have any kind of runner on it, right? Even the GT3 cars that have a spoiler put in that may be different from the other spoilers that came with it. A great example of that would be like the BMW Z4. It had, you know, it was updated a little bit by little bit four times over the lifespan of that tooling. It has, you know, one of the spoilers just on a little runner that's barely big enough that the, the spoiler fits into. This is just a spoiler in a bag. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it might be resin or it's been taken off the sprue, one of the two. And the uprights the, the, and the winglets for the spoiler are photo etch pieces. So you got to balance a piece of resin on the photo etch, hinky, with resin winglets. Look there with uh, photo etch winglets. And photo etch winglets, not a big deal. I mean, getting them to stick and make them being straight might be a little dicey, but as far as, you know, just having them be there, that's the easy part. Getting something that's heavier than the object, you're, the tiny, metal, fragile object you're standing it on, you know, and having those be straight up and down and everything else, that might be, like I said, the dicey part. Uh, decals for this kit are basically an entire wrap, uh, so many, many fun decals for that. And, you know, it is what it is. It, it's a, it's something that's going to look kind of, sort of, like the, the real car, but it's not really going to be the real car. But we warned you with that going in, but I also don't know how many people necessarily on this channel will be interested in that. Oh, cat found a piece of, of scrap plastic, and off he goes. Uh, that will take us to... I'm going to go with Fujimi next. We have the uh, reissue, technically, of the Suzuki Hustler, this time as the new Mazda Flare kits. So, yeah, that's obviously just so much of Suzuki Hustler with Mazda badges on it. Uh, they didn't do two of these kits, so you have your choice. You can get it in the white pearl uh, plastic, which is what this one is. Uh, really, this is exactly the Suzuki Hustler kit. Nothing new about it. No new parts at all uh, other than decals. Now, this does, much like the, the reissue of the Hustler in white, does come with decal sheets for certain things, like the... Uh, Mazda logos for the wheel logos for the rear end logos the some of the instrument panel uh, decals and there is also a yellow version active yellow is what they call this I'm assuming the top is molded in black because it's the whole no paint no glue thing uh, I didn't really look at the parts close enough to, to care but you know it's it's just <laughs> if you build one or a hustler, or have them both, both at the same time. You will be the only kid on your block with a Mazda Flare crossover. I can pretty much guarantee it. Take that to your stodgy old man gas R model club and see what comes of that. Uh, then we have one kit release from Hasegawa for this week, and that is the other half of the brand new tool uh, R31 Skyline GTS R. This is obviously the streetcar version. Uh, so. We've shown you all of these parts uh, at the Shizuka Hobby Show video. Go back and look at those. Obviously, the major differences here between this car and the race car are street tires, street wheels, a street gas tank, a street interior, if that makes any sense. Obviously, it's not a gutted interior like the race car. And then it has the other uh, trunk and rear spoiler uh insert because if you don't know you haven't seen that video what Hasegawa did with this kit in order to make the uh, trunk which has fuel doors in the top of the trunk which is not that uncommon for a 1980s race car and the civilian car which obviously would not have that is that the trunk is a separate piece uh, this represents a 1987 GTSR this car specifically this car specifically as it is on the box art is the homogenization car for the race car. 
much like all race cars in Group A at the time, you had to make 500 or whatever the number was. I believe it was 500 for this. You had to make 500 street cars in order to race the race cars. So these cars in sort of this midnight purple color, and I don't know what other colors the GTSR came in, but the GTSR streetcar specifically is the homogenization streetcar of the race car. So interesting little factoid if you care on your Nissan. And that will take us to Aoshima, which had a couple of restocks and a couple of uh, reissues. The restocks are... Hey, we just talked about these. The Season 1 Knight Rider kit car and the uh, Season 4 Knight Rider kit car. I really don't know what the difference is between the two. I think the Season 4 car has a slightly different front end as far as the uh, driving lights go. There's like two on the Season 4 and three on the Season 1. I, I, I'm guessing. Uh, I, I don't have... I've. I don't believe I've ever had a Knight Rider kit. I think I had the MPC version, which is, whoo, boy, a bad kit, because that's based on a mediocre uh, annual as it is. And then I, I like Knight Rider the show, but I don't know. It's hard to explain my tastes in, in models. It's a lot of things where I, man, I really like that, but I wouldn't want to build a model of it. I know that makes no sense, but it's just the way uh, what's left of my mind after 20 years of driving and three children is uh comes to at this point and then we have on the reissue side of things these are going to be reissues of kits into new box art in the tune model car lineup you have the re and uh amenemia or amemia uh yeah amemia uh fc3s rx7 so obviously the big difference here between this and a regular street rx7 would be the clear uh headlight covers over sort of standard uh headlights rather than the pop-ups. Uh, different set of wheels, different set of ground effects, obviously a hood with the hood louvers and things like that, and all the REMMEA uh, graphics that go along with this. It is uh, right-hand drive only. There is no engine, so it is curbside. There are some of those FD3 or FC3Ss, rather, that have an engine insert. This is not one of them. If you want a street car, well, the street car was just reissued not that long ago, so this is pretty much you want this specific body kit. Uh, and... Uh, I don't know what else to say about that. I had a thought there, and it was going to be changing the subject. <clears throat> but it seemed too abrupt, and instead it was just a cluster of mumbling. You have this. This is the other one. This is the Genesis uh, R30 Skyline. So this is essentially the R30 Skyline that was just reissued a few months ago as well. Uh, this has some Pana Sport-ish looking wheels, and you have the lower body uh, ground-clad uh, body cladding ground effects uh, that are from the Genesis thing. Now I looked at the instructions to this and I looked at the instructions and the kit contents for the one of these R30s that I just picked up at the beginning of the year and to me those Panasport wheels were not enough to justify buying another R30 Skyline. Sorry Aoshima, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, even even if I was like rolling in cash, I'd, I'd just I, I, I was gonna. I had this on pre-order and I canceled the pre-order. I think mostly because it was one of those side effects of talking to people. Like I had new two or three people personally who were super excited to have this specific kit back because it hasn't been out in like 15 years, and I got caught up in that. Woo! And I was like, ah. <laughs> these R30 kits are are pretty sketch to begin with because of the fact that they're old motorized kits. And you guys know how I feel about old motorized kits anyway. I was like, I, I don't know that I would ever build two of them. I, I barely built the one of them ever, but I, the two? Mm. And so I, I punched out on that. Nothing saying that you shouldn't if you like it, if you had, didn't pick up this just street stock RS2000 one. Uh, but, you know, that's back out there if you're interested in it. And then uh, the last kit we're going to talk about is something that's probably not going to make people very happy necessarily, uh, depending on your view of things. Uh, but... That would be this. This is the most recent release from The Ravel. Remember, we're calling it The Ravel, like The Ohio State now, because of the whole fact that Ravel in the United States doesn't exist anymore, so there's not really a Ravel of Germany anymore either. This is the 35th uh, anniversary Volkswagen Golf GTI Pirelli edition. This also, much like we were just talking about, comes with paint and glue. So how that's going to affect air travel should be interesting. Um, 
I don't believe there's a second version of this coming out in the sense of being boxed without the paint and glue. So you're going to get stuck with a bottle of Revell Kantaka no matter what. Uh, the glue, from what I understand, is pretty good glue. Uh, I pitched the paint because it's going to be useless. The paintbrush is probably also useless. Depends on what kind of quality brush it is. But this is a legitimately modified reissue. And the reason, well, other than the fact that it's a new kit and we have to talk about it, that I'm talking about it is the fact that, holy mother of God, look, it's a Ravel kit. Everybody was so convinced that, you know, Ravel was done, 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 regardless of how much we said, no, no, Ravel of Germany is still operating, Ravel of the United States, that's where the weird, the wishy-washy weirdness comes in. So yeah, this guy just got released. In addition to just being a reissue of the Volkswagen Golf GTI, this kit has new wheels. Obviously, these are the P-hole wheels. Get your mind out of that gutter. Stop snickering. Also has a new front new front end parts to it. It has the four uh, headlight grill rather than the two headlight grill the original GTI kit came with. It has a new different uh, new bumper, a new front fascia with that sort of front little lip spoiler, and then it also has a new rear end as well because this updates the kit to a 1983 uh, Golf GTI. The original one was something like a 1978 or 79 GTI, I believe, because I think the, the Cabriolet is an 81. But at any rate, there are a significant upgrades to certain to the visual aspects of this kit p wheels notwithstanding uh that you know make this a not a significant in the sense of like oh my god but you know it's a significant reissue in the sense that they're still operating they're not just reissuing this just old kits over and over again or they're reissuing things that they had already planned to because like the shelby series one uh kit was reissued the 97 ford F-150 flare side was reissued this month as well. Uh, we didn't talk about that because those kits were just reissued here in the United States not that long ago. And, uh, you know, you really would not be going out and buying Ravel Germany kits on purpose at this point of things you could still find easily and cheaply on eBay. But that one uh, is, you know, like a big deal because, oh, my God, it's, you know, a actual legit, you know, newly tool pieces Ravel kit. So Ravel... In Germany, chugging along. Told you it would, and it is. Uh, I guess that pretty much wraps it up. I want to tell you a quick little... My battery's dying because I'm not plugged in down here. But a uh, quick little anecdote from the Postal Service. Uh, Jacques, <laughs> good guy in Canada, bought our Mitsubishi Evo Lancer 3. Uh, he wanted me to you know, autograph it for some reason, so I did. And I sent it out to him, and he lives up in Quebec. So this is not a long journey, right? Montreal, I'm not talking where he lives, but Montreal from here is yeah, around about an eight-hour drive, right? Because you got to go all the way up into New, into New York and up that way, or go up around Buffalo and, and up through Ontario and across. But anyway, it's it's not terribly far away. I mailed this kit to him on June 11th and expected it to be there in about two weeks or so, based on what I the, the shipping that I chose. And uh, so I watch it, and it tracks out of my post office up to the regional sort center where I used to work. And then it goes out to JFK, which is where the international mail goes through if you live on the East Coast. If you live a little west of here, it goes through Chicago, but Pennsylvania is on that line. And so our stuff goes out through JFK. And then it went to Newark Airport, which was odd because it shouldn't have gone there. And then it disappeared for about a week. And then it showed up in Italy. We can all laugh about this now because there's a happy ending to the story. But, yeah, so it showed up in Italy. And it didn't just show up in Italy. It went down the line to, like, a regional post office in the south of Italy. Like, it has so many places that could have been stopped and turned around. And it, went, and it sat there for a while. And so after it sat there for about two weeks, I uh, went down to my post office and I said, what do we need to do to get this box back? Because it's in Italy and it should have went to Quebec. It's not like you sent it to the wrong country, which you did, but you also sent it to the wrong continent in the process. And uh, they were, their reaction was basically like, well, you just got to wait for it to come back. It'll get sent back eventually. You just got to wait for it to come back. And so I'm waiting and waiting and God bless Jacques. He's a patient guy. And, uh, you know, I told him, let's check your track and see if it shows up in Italy for you. And he checked it. Sure enough, in Canada Post, it shows up in Italy as well. And, uh, you know, time goes by, time goes back. July 10th, which was my birthday, they sent it back out through it, through Italian customs. And I'm like, okay, well, it's going to come somewhere, right? And uh, a couple days ago, we got a notice in the mail for a package uh, 
And I'm like, oh, you know what this is? This is that stupid box from Italy, and I'm going to have to pay to resend it to Quebec. And I, in my mind, had come up with a whole big argument about how they should send it back on their own dime because they sent it to the wrong place in the first place. It's not like you went to a restaurant and you ordered a meal and you got the wrong, it's, they sent it to the wrong table and then tried to send it back to you half eaten and then it would charge you to remake their meal. Oh, I was all fired up for that. And uh, the next day, I get an email from Jacques showing me the box and the kit and the fact that it didn't get destroyed in the process. So the tracking on my end did not update until that day, but apparently on the 16th of July, it actually ended up in Canada, and then it took another seven days from there, over a weekend, so five days more or less, to actually get it to him. And, uh, yeah, so... <laughs> I don't know what to say. You know, you could. I, I bag on the postal service because I used to deal with working for them, hauling their mail. Uh, you know, as a contractor, and some of the stuff I saw happen in the sort centers it was ridiculous. Obviously, the box was either misscanned because it was with something. Oh. All right. So obviously, separate day, different time. But I wanted to finish the story. Uh, what had happened there was the battery on well, my laptop had actually died. Uh, been keeping it upstairs so that I could play uh, World of Warcraft with the wife and bring it downstairs into the stash here to uh, film these videos. And uh, yeah, I, I've screwed around with the model too long before I should record the video and killed half my battery just having the thing idling uh, in various uh, Facebook chats. But at any rate, uh, the point I was making there is when packages are being sorted in the automated uh, sorter at a UPS or USPS facility. Uh, if your package happens to be behind something that has a barcode on it, I mean, you, if you, uh, have ever obviously mailed something, you know, they put a little barcode sticker thing on your package, no matter how you address it yourself. And, uh, you know, if your package happens to be right behind a package and it scans the one, it'll just kick everything that's, you know, in that little area into the bin. Um, uh, it's not supposed to allow things to clump together like that but you know things happen and it got kicked into a bin going to Italy or uh you know it got to a point where it was being hand sorted at that point and someone threw it in the wrong bin everything worked out so it's one of those situations where you can laugh about it later but at the time it was really really not funny because uh, I was pretty much firmly convinced that I was going to have to purchase another duplicate of that kit send it to Canada and hope that I would eventually get the first one back or have to file the insurance claim on it, and, you know, to get my money back. But mercifully, none of that ended up happening. So anyway, that brings a wrap to the end of this episode. One of those, you know, everybody has their postal service horror stories, but that's certainly got to be one, one up there. Cause that's, that's just, whew. that, that package traveled. It took, it took a great deal more vacations than I have in the last uh, four years. That's for sure. Anyway, hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you guys on the other side.